We're good? All right, cool. All right, so um, let's get started. Uh, we're just about three minutes late, so I hope it's not going to cut into the end of this deck. This is the first time I've talked about this kind of formally in uh, pretty much forever, so uh, I don't really have any kind of pacing set up for this one, so I don't know how long it's going to go. So we'll just go right into it. So um, my name is Martin Resch. I'm the CTO and founder of SourceFire. Uh, which uh, many people who are out there who know me know me better as the, the guy who wrote Snort originally. And um, so today I'm going to tell you how to make mad loot with open source. <laughs> so, uh, so right up front, I'd just like to apologize to the guys at uh, despair.com. Uh, since we're doing a business presentation, I figured their, uh, their demotivators were only too appropriate. Uh, so uh, hopefully they're not going to see this on the internet and sue me. Um, so that said, let's get right into it. So this talk is um, this talk is kind of about how SourceFire started and open source's role there and what open source uh, is and does for us at SourceFire and a lot of it uh, uh, kind of talks about me and my motivation. So I hope I'm not going to come off as pretentious uh, as I do this. This talk is not meant to be about me or my motivations. Uh, but that said, let's talk a little bit about me for a second. Um, <laughs> So I always find it really interesting to uh, find out kind of the backgrounds of people and where they came from um, when you're finding out, you know, you, you know people out there in the industry who are, uh, uh, who have done things or who are responsible for things that have kind of uh, weighty meaning associated with them. So for example, my, my CEO of my existing co of SourceFire is uh, a guy who in his previous job was responsible for about a billion and a half dollars in revenue a year. Uh, and, you know, we've ta talked, obviously, we spent a, a good deal amount of time talking, and, you know, his dad was a barber and his mom was a nurse. Well, you know, everybody comes from some place, and I always think it's kind of interesting. Um, my dad was a, a high school teacher and my mom was a nurse, uh, and, uh, you know, I held a variety, you know, coming up uh, where I came from, I held a variety of crappy jobs before I got into uh, uh, engineering. Um, my, uh, my first real job was weeding onion fields, uh, which I did for about two weeks, and then decided that McDonald's would be a better place to work. Um, so I was a, uh, a cook at McDonald's for a while. I uh, got my start in computers as a computer store technician in retail when I was in high school. Uh, eventually I got my engineering degree, got into security in 1996, and in 1998 I started writing a little project that uh, I called Snort. So Snort is kind of an interesting, uh, interesting animal. Um, you know, Snort's an open source project, and it's kind of fascinating um, now with what SourceFire's done and what we've accomplished and having Snort as kind of this open source core, how much mystery there is around the open source concept and the projects and how you do them and how they work and stuff like that. If you talk to people who aren't close to it, who don't use the technology, who aren't engineers or coders or IT guys and stuff like that, this stuff is like, you know, it, it's a miracle. Software just appears. Nobody charges me money for it. Is this stealing? Is this okay? Um, the basic idea of open source is pretty simple. Um, you get an idea, you develop in the open, right? You do a public CVS server, uh, you get out there and post up a website, you talk with your community, and then you, you crank out releases. You actually write software and release it. And it doesn't have to be feature complete. It doesn't have to even be ready for prime time. It can be the roughest idea of what you've got in mind. And if you do it right, if you communicate with your community, the thing will start picking up momentum. And that's what happened with Snort. So Snort is the world's most popular uh, network intrusion detection and prevention system. Uh, I originally started writing Snort in a spare bedroom in my house in 1998. Um, in the first year that I was working on Snort, I did 20 releases. So about every two weeks, I was doing a Snort release uh, and, uh, and gaining community around the project. And I wasn't doing anything special. I would come home at night from my day job. I was working for a defense contractor. Uh, I would uh, sit down on my computer after my wife went to bed, and I'd write code for a while and answer email for a while. Um, and answering email is actually kind of the other side of the coin with open source projects. You've got to write code and release it and get it out there and get people using it, but you've also got to interact with your community. I wrote about, uh, that I know of, that I've been able to kind of establish metrics around, I'm sure there's a lot of lost data here, uh, well over 3,000 emails uh, between mid-1999 and 2002 on the Snort mailing lists. Um, that's a lot of email, right? That's a lot of typing. And this wasn't, you know, just, you know, thanks, I'll get back to you, that kind of stuff. This was technical detail, how the system works, ideas I've got, solving bugs, uh, solving problems for people, telling them how to use it, telling them how to hook up MySQL to Snort, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it was a major effort, you know, at the point that I started SourceFire, I kind of figured I was already working 40 hours a week on Snort anyway, I may as well make some money on it. Um, and then the other part, develop in the open, put your source code out there. So before there was SourceFire, there was, a, there was another company. 
Um, and I worked for this company from uh, late 99 to early 2000. I'm wearing their shirt there. This is a picture of me with uh, much darker hair and uh, a much better attitude, probably. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it was really interesting. This was a, uh, a Bay Area company out in California. They had really good people. They had really interesting ideas. And the atmosphere was cool. I don't know how many of you have worked for a startup, but you know, once you've worked for a startup, if you come from a, uh, from a large environment, there's, there's really no going back. If it hooks you, um, it's great because everybody's there. We're all pulling on the oars the same direction. We've all got the same goal, right? Mad loot. <laughs> everybody gets rich. Everybody gets famous. Uh, eBay buys us. Google buys us. Somebody uh, buys us or we IPO and uh, you know, everybody gets rich. And that happens in a vanishingly small percentage of the cases uh, of these companies, but it is a possibility. And I really got hooked by this. Um, so I was into this, but there was a problem. Uh, at this particular company, um, we had kind of a, a fundamental problem with the company. And um, the problem with this company, which turned out to be very disappointing, was that the founder of that company was, uh, was not, not very much fun to work with. And I'll kind of leave things at that, but uh, eventually the company kind of evaporated out from under uh, the, uh, um, the person who was leading the charge there. So that was, uh, that was very disappointing, and this was in uh, uh, late 2000. So at this point, I kind of was thinking about, what am I going to do next? Can I, should I go get a job? Uh, you know, as the guy who had written Snort, getting job offers wasn't a hard thing to do, right? In the security industry, it wasn't hard to come by. People who had problems with packets that they wanted to solve, people who had, uh, you know, uh, who th saw I was capable of executing on uh, developing large code bases and communicating effectively with people and what I like to be a project lead or a lead architect or something like that. Um, so Snort kind of set me up and established me so that getting a job in the industry wasn't too hard. But I had a bunch of people who were saying, hey, you should really start a company around Snort. You know, there's a lot of people out there who are using this, why not start a company around it? So I would usually respond with something like, okay, great. So how am I going to get people to pay for something that's free? This is kind of a, you know, this is a fundamental business problem. You have free soap. How are you going to get them to pay for the same soap? But, you know, now it costs money when they can get it for free and it's, you know, it's lying in, you know, on the street or they can get it anywhere, pick it up uh, anywhere they want to. Uh, and also, what business model should I get into, right? We could do a services company around this. This was the classic open source model uh, back in 2000, 2001. Do kind of a red hat thing where you establish services around your open source technology and you keep moving the technology forward and keep delivering services around it. Uh, well, I'm not that kind of guy. I don't really know a whole lot about services. I like building products. My, you know, the thing that really uh, turns my dial is uh, having people use stuff that I've created. So I wanted to do a product company, and, and this was, uh, this was you know, fraught with difficulty because nobody was doing open source product companies. Nobody was trying to solve this problem, or at least all the uh, attempts at that point hadn't gone very well. But I had a little bit of experience with my previous startup that gave me some, some kind of guidelines for how to get going with this company, right? And it's simple stuff. It sounds simple, but it's actually hard to execute on, right? Hire good people. How hard is that? Well, it's really hard, especially people you want to work with every day, 80 hours a week, because that's what you're going to be doing in the early days of your company. Don't be a dick. <laughs> this is a big problem we had in my previous company. The guy who was in my role there, not fun to work with. Uh, and then total failure can be pushed off for a long, long time. This is something that I learned early on. Um, you know, I saw companies that other people that I knew were doing, and they were only moderately successful, but they kept plugging away. They kept going. It's actually pretty hard to kill a company. Maybe not today, especially with venture back companies and things like that. Uh, but back then, it seemed like it was ver you could screw up endlessly, and the company would keep stumbling on and stumbling on. So I figured I had, you know, uh, in video game parlance, I had a few lives to, uh, to blow through before I uh, had to be exactly right about it. So I decided I was going to start a company. I was going to build around Snort. And you know, taking stock of Snort was really important at this time. We kind of had to know what, we, what, I, what I had my hands around back then. Snort was about 40,000 lines of code. We have over 5,000 subscribers on the Snort user mailing list at that point. And we're, we're getting about 10,000 downloads a week off Snort.org. And then this bottom point here is actually the critical, one of the critical uh, data points that got me to say, you know what, I'll figure out this business model. I'm going to do this, and we'll see uh, what works. Um, there was a survey from a large educational institute that does IT training uh, that showed that uh, they basically asked people, which IDS are you using? This is before IPS came out. 92% of the respondents said we were using Snort. Maybe they're using Snort in something else. Uh, in a lot of cases, they were using Snort in something else. But 92% of the time, Snort was in there. Well, this was big, right? 92% of the places that were doing intrusion detection were using Snort, or at least that were sending their people out for training. Uh, that was big. because. That gave me confidence that, you know what, there's a bunch of people out there 
um, who have a problem that needs to be solved, because I knew the problems with Snort. So we're going to build an open source product company. And we're going to figure out how to get people to pay. So why are people going to pay for open source? What are you going to do to get them to pay? Well, I thought basically, how about the aspirin model? We'll take away their pain. Because there's all sorts of pain associated with doing something like running Snort, or any security tools in a lot of cases, right? If you think about your firewalls, your intrusion detection systems, your vulnerability management systems, NetFlow, anything like that, what are the main problems that you run into from a user standpoint? It's not getting the technology to work. If you bought it, it probably works you know, well enough at the fundamental sensing level, at the fundamental doing its, its thing level. The thing that's really hard to get right is scalability and manageability. And nobody was getting that right in the open source world. We built a really effective, powerful intrusion detection sensor in Snort. Everybody was using it. Uh, it was doing a, uh, a good job. Um, we had constant development. We had constant feedback from the community. It was a very popular project. But the things that nobody was solving, people were kind of trying to figure out a way to solve it, was things like scalability. How do I take, uh, OK, you know, I've got one snort sensor. And now I want to turn it into 100 snort sensors at my enterprise and be able to bring all that data back and manage all that policy and things like that. How am I going to do that? Well, you're not going to do that screwing around with MySQL and PHP. That's a hard problem. That's, you know, capital H, capital P, hard problem. Uh, something that's going to take some engineering time to solve. Uh, manageability is a big deal, too, because there are lots of buttons and dials and uh, you know, scales and things like that to tweak uh, on a system like Snort. Right? I want to have reporting. I want to have policy management. I want to have health monitoring. I want to have performance monitoring. I want all these things that don't really have anything to do with Snort you know, in the actual intrusion detection problem of getting that problem done, uh, but need to be solved, because and I need to solve them at scale. And I also wanted to make things easy to install and support. Now, back in 2000, 2001, um, you know, going into the intrusion detection game, it seemed like it was a pretty stupid idea, because there was an established market out there, and a lot of people had been doing it, and acquisitions had already been made in the space and things like that. Um, but none of the solutions that were out there um, were really very good. They kind of did the intrusion detection thing, but even the biggest vendors that were out there hadn't figured out the scalability and manageability thing very well. Scaling the amount of data that they could accept, ease of install, ease of use, uh, even good support. In a lot of cases, it was easy to find people who were disgruntled with the level of support that they were getting from their vendors, and these were major vendors. So I decided, look, I'm going to establish a company, and this model is going to be value-add around open source. So I went out and I started kind of querying my advisors and getting kind of second and third uh, level advisors in to kind of vet my idea. And their reaction was pretty much this. <laughs> Dumb idea, kid. This will never work. Uh, why will it never work? Well, uh, the two reasons that usually came up were these two. People only use Snort because it's free. They don't use it because it's good. OK. Uh, we can argue about that, but OK. Um, and then the other thing that came out was, Nobody's ever been successful with a value-added uh, product model with open source before. Therefore, it cannot be done, right? If nobody's done it before, you can't possibly do it. And, uh, and oh, by the way, the only reason your core technology is popular is because it's free, not because it's good. Now, there are a lot of people out there who, um, who have varying opinions on uh, you know, whether or not a business model like this is good or effective or can be good and effective. But you know, the thing that I notice with most people is that they seem to have a pretty poor understanding of kind of the core value I was trying to, uh, to get at. And, um, and I think they really misunderstood how popular Snort was. Now, I didn't. And, and quite frankly, I still don't know why Snort is as popular as it is. I mean, it's got a lot of cool things and bells and whistles. And it's a fun community to interact with. Uh, it was especially back then. Um, but it's complex technology. And it throws a lot of raw data at you that you have to be a fairly sophisticated person to really understand. Um, so, you know, I had my doubts uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, I, I thought I, I knew better. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to go for it. Because I don't think these people understand what they're talking about. I thought I knew better. And one of the great things about uh, um, being an entrepreneur is uh, I had a, uh, an investor once tell me that um, a great entrepreneur was a person with a, uh, an overdeveloped sense of optimism and an underdeveloped sense of fear. Uh, and I think that works well. <laughs> I think that works really well in the startup environment. So I went for it because I thought I knew better than these people. And yeah, sure, he's got 20 years of experience and he's a VP of engineering at a, you know, an internet startup that made billions of dollars and stuff like that. But I don't think he understands open source. I don't think this person knows why Snort is popular because I can't even say why it's popular. And I don't think it's because it's free. 
So I incorporated the company in 2001, and the idea was simple. We're going to build snort-based intrusion detection appliances and management infrastructure because everybody else sucks. <laughs> when I say everybody else sucks, I mean all my primary competitors, right? And I'm not trying to be cheeky or anything like that. Uh, I really mean it. I mean, we went out there and we acquired our, uh, our primary competitor's technology, and we went to deploy it. Uh, I spent seven hours one day getting uh, one of my primary large router vendor uh, competitor's uh, device up and running. Seven hours. Me, right? I, can, I like to think I know what I'm doing, and this thing was taking forever. Uh, the other vendor, major vendor's uh, product only took five hours to get running. It was ridiculous. You had to go out and you had to buy all this stuff, right? You buy the sensor infrastructure, you buy the hardware, you'd install the software on the hardware, then you'd go get a third-party database, right? Because you want to manage all this data. You'd have to go deploy Oracle and get an army of DBAs hanging out to get all the stuff working together. When something broke, it was, you know, it was like this. Oh, it's the Oracle guy's fault. It's the, the router vendor's fault, you know, stuff like that. There was tons of room in this market um, for coming out with a solution that was better, that was more transparent, that could work better, that could give better, uh, people better value for their money. So I decided to go for it. So I started the company, and uh, about a month later, I got uh, $100,000 in angel investment um, from a, a friend of mine. Uh, that I ran the company on. And it turned out I ended up running the company on that $100,000 for about 10 months. Because getting funding in 2001 was, as they say, difficult. Um, it's probably, it was probably not quite as difficult as it is right now, but it was on the same order of magnitude. Uh, back in 2001, the VCs talk about the 2001 as nuclear winter, right? And the reason that they talk about it this way is because this was right after the dot-com bubble collapse. Once the dot-coms collapsed, the VCs were, you know, surveying a vast landscape of wreckage out there. They were spinning down companies and selling companies when they could and shutting them down and firing people left and right. Uh, it was crazy. So here's me. Marty Resch shows up at the door and I'm like, hey, I got a great idea. I've got this open source company and we're going to make a lot of money selling intrusion detection. And they were like, what? Are you kidding me? Right? So when I went to these places, I was driving all on, hey, I got Snort. Snort's really popular. Everybody's using it. It's a great technology. And it's me. And, you know, it's me was important because my reputation had been uh, increased. My profile had been increased in the industry quite a bit, uh, but having written Snort, having built the community and things like that. But when the VCs looked at us, it was all negatives, right? Utterly inexperienced management team. I think that actually understates the case uh, quite a bit. Uh, the team wasn't just utterly inexperienced, it was kind of tragically inexperienced. Uh, and, uh, and I was, you know, and I was the guy running the show. Um, I didn't know, I, you know, if we wrote down a list of everything I know and everything I didn't know, we could probably fill up the 320 gig hard drive on this laptop with the stuff that I didn't know and uh, we wouldn't need this whole piece of paper for the stuff I did know. So we didn't have a lot of experience. We didn't really know what we were doing. We were pre-revenue, we hadn't sold anything yet. That's VC speak for hadn't sold anything yet. And we were late to market in a crowded space. Cisco was there, ISS was there, uh, Intrusion.com was there, Interesis was there, um, NFR was there, and there were probably a few others that I'm not remembering. Computer Associates was there and, and stuff like that. So there were a bunch of guys, they'd been competing for quite a while, uh, and um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the minuses outweighed the pluses, you know, by, by quite a bit. So this is the, the usual response I got. Call us back when you make some money, kid. Now, knowing what I know now, I can't blame them. Uh, if you look at the whole VC game and you look at, you know, how much money these guys uh, put into uh, companies and what the, the expected returns are, you know, the chances of a return are, it's pretty amazing. So here are the odds. Okay, so one in 500 business plans gets funded. So you write a business plan, you've got an idea for a WYSI startup, and you know, you're tragically inexperienced like me, and you show up at a VC's doorstep and you say, hey, I got a great plan, I want to sell dog food on the internet. And they take a look at it and they say, no way, <laughs> right? Um, we've seen 10 companies like that, you're the worst one we've seen yet, get out. <clears throat> one in 500 business plans gets funded. One in 1,000 founders last past the first year uh, post-funding. I found that to be a really interesting uh, data point. This actually comes from one of our VCs, one of our VCs that we eventually got. <laughs> one in 2,500 companies that uh, shows up at the doorstep has any kind of liquidity event. So this is getting bought, getting your money back, or having an IPO. One in 2,500 chance of that. And then, better, one in 50,000 actually man manages to make it to an IPO. So if anybody walking out, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm getting a golf clap from the back of the room. Um, so uh, 
if you want to look at the, the odds here, the chances of you showing up at Mr. VC's door and being the guy that's going to IPO a company sometime down the road are vanishingly small. But from the entrepreneur's standpoint, we, we always have this to look at. It's 180,089,125 to win the Powerball lottery. So, you know, from that standpoint, if you're on the entrepreneur side, doing, uh, doing startups is great because you've got radically better odds than the lottery of, uh, of IPOing and, you know, getting all the IPO glory. I could do a whole other presentation on how much fun that is, but we're not going to go there. So, um, so we weren't going to get any money in 2001. In fact, we were getting uh, denied with extreme prejudice everywhere we went in 2001. So uh, we took it, uh, did, took it to heart and decided to get to work. Uh, and we started cranking out product. We spent six months generating the, the initial SourceFire product release. And in the fall of 2001, we released the first uh, intrusion sensor and did our first customer ship in late September of 2001, which was, you know, interesting timing giving September 11th. All of a sudden, everybody's security awareness was uh, greatly increased and things like that. But you know, the interesting thing about our initial sales out of SourceFire was that, you know, we did these initial sales between uh, late September and mid-December. Our first four customers were all Fortune 1000s, and three out of four of them did six-figure deals out of the door. And not just that, not only were they buying from us and doing relatively big deals from a company that, quite frankly, was me and three guys in my living room, right? <laughs> but they were spending significant sums of money doing this. And to give you kind of a level, okay, so a little walk down memory lane, this was SourceFire in 2001. This is uh, my living room in late September 2001. We had just gotten our SourceFire shirts. That guy there is wearing his, uh, his SourceFire shirt. Oh, so is he. So everybody was styling in their new SourceFire polos. But this was, you know, this is my house. This is the living room where SourceFire started. That's my kitchen where we did build-outs. Uh, you can see that stack of boxes there. That stack of boxes is our first order. That's our first $100,000 order getting ready to go out the door. And yes, that is a cat sitting on top of it. <laughs> and that guy right there in the chair is, my, uh, is the manager of my um, uh, maintenance engineering team now. He's still with the company. The cat, the cat holds the uh, deceased position. <laughs> She's no longer with us, unfortunately. Uh, and this was our lab at the time. So to say we were shoestringy is overstating the case. Uh, but you know, if you're you know if you're if you're dedicated, if you're working really hard, if you've got good ideas and good technology, you can turn this into what we have today, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, you know, and it's pretty amazing. You know, you look at this this fire hazard over here in the corner, and you look at this table here, that end table from Walmart that uh, was uh, supporting our development uh, environment. Uh, it's pretty scary how shoe stringy it was, but we got through it, and uh, eventually, you know, we started selling. So why did people buy? from a company that, quite frankly, could have been wiped out by, you know, a bad day at the Mexican restaurant, <laughs> right? So we could have gotten some, uh, some bad burritos and that would have been it. Our support would have been gone for a week or two, right? Why did people buy from us? People bought from us because of open source. They had trust in the company. And this is really fascinating. Once people knew it was me, I was, I was doing the selling back then. So literally, they were on the phone with me, on the phone, and I was out on my deck selling to customers, selling to big customers, government contractors, um, financial firms, things like that. They knew it was me. The guys I was talking to were open source users. So these were guys who had been used to interacting with me via email, via IRC, for years anyway. And they were in positions of power now. They had budget, or they were a technical decision maker, or whatever. They had the ability to leverage the relationship that we had established solely over the internet, and they had budget. So they're like, well, we need a new IDS solution. We've tried the majors. That hasn't worked very well. We're running Snort anyway. Why don't we go to the professional version and uh, see if we can, we can make it better? There was a very, very large user community out there that was the vanguard of SourceFire's customers, and they continue to be that way. Snort users, every Snort user, from my perspective, is a potential SourceFire customer once their pain point gets to a sufficient level, right? Once they have to start scaling it, once they need manageability, once their boss tells them, hey, I need something that's supported by a third party because, you know, we've got to demonstrate Starbox compliance or PCI compliance or whatever. Once they get to that point where they have the problem that SourceFire solves, it's very easy and natural for a Snort user to switch over to SourceFire because it's, you know, it's what they're used to. It's more scalable, it's more manageable, it's easy to deploy, it's supported, uh, and it's got a really good research team behind it. So every Microsoft Tuesday, the patches come out, your systems automatically update. And we've got all sorts of other cool bells and whistles in there too. Back then, not, not so much. But now, yeah, the stuff's there. So once we started selling, guess who showed up? 
These guys, venture capitalists, are good friends. And the VC were very interested in talking to us because I'd done about $350,000 in business from out of my living room, literally, uh, in a very short period of time. So once we had done that, you know, they saw, hey, Marty's actually kind of taking orders here right now, right? It's not like he's going out there and doing a bunch of marketing. I was doing marketing on the store mailing list by virtue of my signature saying, hey, you know, professional snort devices, right? Enterprise class uh, snort, available at sourcefire.com. My email address was sourcefire.com, which drew people over, and I would speak at conferences. And that was kind of the entirety of our marketing back then. So we were literally, you know, the phone was ringing, or I was, uh, you know, not the phone was ringing, I was getting emails from people, and that was turning into orders. Um, so towards the end of 2001, I started a serious process to raise, um, raise venture capital. And the reason that I did that, and the reason that many of you, if you have an open source project, would probably want to do that, was due to the market dynamics. Um, if you look at the... Uh, if you look at the dynamics of, you know, the market of intrusion prevention in 2001, what you're going to see is you're going to see a bunch of big vendors out there. You're going to see Cisco. You're going to see, well, there was one secure which got bought by uh, Juniper eventually. Um, you're going to see ISS and all the other guys out there. Well, I wanted to compete with Cisco, right, because I knew there were a bunch of customers out there who weren't really thrilled with their Cisco installs, so I wanted to go get them. And if I was going to go get them, if I was going to grab that market share, uh, I was going to need money to do it. Not a little bit of money, a lot of money, right? We'd run the company literally on $100,000 for 10 months. Uh, the guys wanted to have salaries. Like, we weren't even paying salaries uh, in the beginning. We weren't paying salaries. We weren't paying for anything except for equipment to get the stuff built and get it out the door and travel once in a while. So um, we needed money, and we needed quite a bit of money. So I hit the road and started doing, uh, um, started raising the Series A. And I raised it in two tranches, and two tranches means in two pieces. Did a $2 million raise uh, on the first tranche and then $5.65 million on the second tranche. Uh, and flew continuously between uh, Waltham and uh, Palo Alto uh, for about uh, three months. Um, and it was a very, very interesting process. You know, one of the interesting, so I was, uh, I was at a, um, a big, uh, cloud um, service provider uh, a couple of weeks ago and I was talking to them and we were talking about Snort and you know what they're how they're using Snort internally and kind of comparing notes on how we were getting it to scale and things like that because these guys are very big and they're probably not going to want Sourcefire for a while um, and um, so we were talking about it and the, you know we got talking about what kind of companies are you interested in Marty what uh, what what are you thinking about buying um, you know, are, are you thinking about buying companies and things like that? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, you know, how do you, you know, when you look at these guys, how do you look at them? I said, well, usually I look at their technology first to see if it's interesting, and then I look at their balance sheet to see how they're doing. And these guys were like, you know, it was a room full of engineers, and they are all kind of shocked that, you know, Marty's, you know, Marty's looking at balance sheets. Um, but it's important, right? I raised this entire Series A by myself and learned a lot in the process. It's very important that if you're going to do an open source company, especially if you're the guy, you know, the main guy who's running the company, who founded the company and things like that, you're going to have to be very hands-on uh, in the early stages. So I went out there. I talked to a total of, I think, 24 different VC organizations. At the end of the day, I got four term sheets, which is, hey, we're interested in funding you. Here are our terms. You know, uh, we're going to use Vaseline. We're not going to use Vaseline. We're going to use sand and broken glass, you know, whatever. Um, if you understand the investing process, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and I decided to uh, go with uh, Sierra Ventures as my, uh, my Series A lead. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, you ask the question, okay, so why'd they fund you? You're an open source core technology with this value-add model that was really unproven back then. Why did they fund us? Well, they funded us because we were making money, money when I was the only guy selling. And if, and if I can sell this stuff, imagine what could happen if you got guys who actually knew what they were doing selling this stuff, right? Because we were targeting a very specific market. We wanted to sell to the enterprise market. The enterprise market, I figured, was our sweet spot. Because these were the people who were going to have uh, a need for a lot of snort sensors, right? They had the scale problem that uh, we were going to get into. They also had a lot of money, right? So you want to go find a, uh, a market that's got the problem that you're trying to solve and that has a lot of money. And they, for, for us, that was the enterprise. And we were able to sell to these guys with just me doing the selling. So it didn't matter that I didn't know how to do a pipeline, that I didn't know how to do a forecast. I had an embarrassing moment at a VC once where I didn't know the difference between bookings and revenues. <laughs> right? Um, so there was a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't know back then. But you know, despite that, we were making money. And the open source thing was actually hugely valuable, once again. 
And the reason that it was valuable was because it established reputation. So as you know, in the security world, reputation is everything, like your reputation as an individual, the reputation of the technologies that you work with, even the reputation of the technologies that you choose to work with is everything. And in an open source project, it's exactly the same way. You know, they talk about the gift economy with open source. Uh, if you read um, the Cathedral and the Bazaar, uh, they'll talk about, you know, kind of the open source principles of release early, release often, and communication. Uh, and also this idea of the gift economy. And the idea of the gift economy is that your reputation is tied directly to uh, the level of contribution that you have to the community. So I had a high reputation in my community, which, you know, started out as a snort community and later kind of bled over into the security industry because of the work that I had done with open source, right? So because I built quality technology, I had a good reputation. Because I interacted with people on a level that was, you know, uh, of equals essentially, because I wasn't a dick, as I said at the beginning of this thing, um, people had high regard for me, and that made getting money easier. Because any time one of these VCs would go out and do reference checks, They'd call up, you know, they'd call up technical guys that they'd been working with for a long time, and they'd say, "Do you know anything about Snort? Do you know anything about Marty Resch?" And, and nine times out of ten, it would come back, um, "Don't know a whole lot about Marty Resch, but I know he has a really good reputation, and you know, uh, I'm not an intrusion detection guy, but I know Snort is everywhere." And that's all it took. It was huge, absolutely huge. Most startups don't have this advantage. If you're just a startup, so if you show up like me, but you don't have, you know, you're doing proprietary Snort instead of open source Snort. You show up at these guys' doors, and nobody knows who you are because you don't have the reputation that's been established by your open source community, and nobody knows anything about your technology. Guess what the chances are that you're going to be that one in 500 that gets funded? Zero, right? No, nothing. You're not going to get squat because nobody knows you. You're going to have to not only have radically reduced chance of getting money, but the amount of time it's going to take to get money is going to be radically increased because you're going to be spending your time establishing your reputation with the VCs, and the way that you're going to do that is you're going to hang out with them lots. You're going to go in there for lots and lots and lots of uh, meetings. And that happened to me. They string you along for a while. They're trying to figure out, you know, who you are and what you're doing, and they bring in one partner or another partner and things like that. Well, until you get to the full partner meeting, you haven't really met with the VCs yet. You've just met with their associates and things like that. And that's when you get to the partner meeting is when they're making a decision about whether or not they're going to fund you. Everything leading up to that is, is quite frankly, making them feel good about taking you to the partner meeting. So, you know, Series A of Sourcefire, I had to do a bunch of that. Once we got funded, Series B, C, and D, we didn't have to do that anymore. Our reputation was established as a company at that point, and people saw that Sourcefire could make money. So this open source thing is absolutely huge for establishing reputation and for getting people comfortable with your company. The difference between having it and not having it is night and day. Can you imagine how difficult it would be to do Sourcefire in 2001 if we hadn't had open source? Think about it. So I'm going into a crowded market space. I'm yet another proprietary solution. I've got an incredibly inexperienced team uh, and a technology that is, you know, roughly on par with all the other technologies that are out there. It doesn't really have much differentiation, at least not that anybody can see. With Snort, everybody knew who we were. Everybody knew the differentiation of the technology. It's open. It's transparent. You can modify it. You can extend it. Everybody had all of that already kind of established. And once that was in place, then it was just convincing these guys that, you know, giving me a few million dollars wasn't the worst bet that they ever made in their life. So once we got open source, it was kind of off to the races. These are results. These are our revenue uh, uh, figures for the last, well, since I started the company. So from uh, about uh, $300,000 the, uh, the first year I was in business up to about uh, 76 million last year. Uh, so that's not too shabby. Um, there's some, uh, if you curve the uh, flat, or graph out the curve here, it flattens in some places and spikes in some others based on kind of uh, externalities that are happening. Like um, uh, we had a failed acquisition that uh, um, by uh, Checkpoint back in uh, 2006 that uh, effectively uh, got the federal government to stop buying our stuff for uh, almost two years, uh, things like that. And then last year you see it, it kicked back in. You can see the bar gets uh, a little taller, a little faster there. Other results are things like this. We were one, in the, one of the one in 50,000 to actually get there and do an IPO. Now you'll notice I'm fast forwarding a bit, <laughs> right? I went from, okay, and this is how we got our VC funding, and voila, IPO. Um, but you know, from an open source standpoint of understanding how this stuff works, there is a lot of stuff that happened between now and then. From 
incorporating the company to the first customer ship of our first product to our first round of VC, to staffing up, shipping new alternate technologies, um, you know, all of these things that had to happen and had to happen well. But most of that stuff is business execution. Uh, if you think you're going to win the hearts and minds of everybody with superior technology, especially selling in the, uh, in the enterprise space, think again. You need solid sales execution, you need solid marketing execution, you need a solid management team. One of the things we did early on in the company was we hired, we really overhired management. We hired uh, a bunch of guys who were qualified to run public companies back when SourceFire was 40 people. Um, and the reason that we did that was that many of those people are still with the company. In fact, the majority of those people are still with the company. We still have our core management team even today uh, that we had in 2002. Uh, and that, that's meaningful because you don't have people who are ramping up, who are coming up to speed on what the technology does and how it works and things like that. Uh, it really means a lot. And there's been all sorts of challenges along the way. You know, we had uh, Gartner declare our core technology declared intrusion detection dead in 2003, so we had to invent a whole other technology to stay relevant. Um, we had a failed acquisition in 2005, 2006, which cost us a lot of momentum in the government. Uh, we had an IPO, which quite frankly uh, was uh, uh, not a high point in the company in some ways. If you know uh, what SourceFire's history has been like as a public company, uh, it's been rocky uh, because uh, we had some execution issues in uh, 2007. And, um, you know, uh, these things happen. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, despite the fact that my stock price is wherever it is today, 650 or something like that, um, People ask, you know, would you do it again knowing that, you know, your, your stock price was going to be a third of what it was uh, shortly after you IPO and things like that? The answer is yeah. There's a lot more strategy to doing IPOs than just, you know, getting the big cash out and walking off into the sunset and being rich and buying Lamborghinis and stuff like that. There's way more to it than that. Um, the things that are there when you IPO, uh, you know, especially if you're not getting bought, it's just getting more money into the company and giving your, your stock a real value that can, be, that can be sold on the street. And let me tell you, as the founder of the company, you're kind of like the captain of the ship. If you want to sell your stock, you're the last man off the boat. You don't get to really sell a whole bunch of stock, <laughs> right? You don't get to buy the Lamborghini and get rich. You can leverage against that if you want to. You're, you know, anybody can be happy to let you leverage up your, uh, your stock, but uh, you know, in these current market conditions, that's probably not such a good idea. But a lot of stuff did happen. But, you know, most of the stuff that's related to open source was early on. All the ideology was cemented in the first year that the company was running. All the uh, operations around the open source model were solidified in the first year, first 18 months of the company. And the open source effect is absolutely huge. It's amazing how impactful open source was for SourceFire. What did open source do for SourceFire? A lot of people talk about, you know, we've put technologies into Snort, uh, some of which are pretty innovative. We got, um, you know, back in 2002, we got Snort running at gigabit speeds. Uh, and, uh, you know, more recently, we're running at 10 gigabit speeds. Uh, we put in uh, new types of detection in there. We put in systems that will uh, allow the, the, uh, the sensors to tune themselves and things like that. We're actually continuing to move the, the ball forward on the technology itself, on the core fundamental technology of how good an IPS can be, how uh, effective you can be by deploying IPS. Uh, we've done those things, and what that's done for us is continue to maintain our community and move it forward. Because what that community does for us is this, gives us trust. People trust us because we keep moving the technology forward, because we've always been a good citizen to them. We've never done things that have hurt our, our users, uh, and we've always tried to move the ball forward. And not only that, but we keep trying to innovate. We come up with new ideas on how to solve the problem, and then we implement them in technology, and we give it away. And why do we do that? Because that builds our addressable community, right? I, I kind of, uh, I look at the, um, uh, the open source community as, um, kind of like this universe of people. If you, uh, so I'm into astronomy. I, I don't know how many people know that. Uh, but I do astronomy as uh, my hobby. And uh, one of the um, underlying uh, themes of uh, kind of uh, cosmology, of understanding how the universe works, is this concept of inflation, of uh, the universe getting bigger all the time um, as a result of the Big Bang. But, you know, it's not the universe that's getting bigger. It's not, you know, more mass is being created. It's space itself is inflating. So it's like the surface of a balloon. It's stretching effectively. Um, well. The open source community is kind of like the universe in that regard. Uh, if I have 5% of the open source market, the way that I continue to grow my user share is not by trying to seize more percentage of the open source market, it's by increasing the number of users that I got. So if I have a constant 5% of the user base out there using my stuff and I want to add people to the mix, I increase my, my open source market. That's very important. And 
it allows us to maintain the effects that open source gives us of trust. People trust us walking in the door. They know who we are and what we're about. It gives us credibility. People took me seriously. Fortune 1000 companies took me seriously selling in shorts and a t-shirt barefoot on the deck of my house uh, in 2001 because they knew who I was, they knew uh, that I was capable of creating good technology, and they knew that I wasn't going to quit. I wasn't just going to disappear like some fly-by-night operation. I was going to be there. I had credibility. Regardless of what my company looked like, you saw what the pictures were there, right? Regardless of what the company looked like, I had credibility, and therefore the company had credibility, and the technology had credibility. We had credibility wrapped all around us as a result of doing this open source project. We had access to. Access is absolutely huge. How many companies do you get pinging on your door all the time saying, hey, would you let me come in and do a demo? Would you let me talk to you? Uh, you know, I want to show you my whiz-bang widget and things like that. It happens to me all the time. I get you know, an absolute massive pile of email every day from people who want to show me something, who want to demo something, who just want five minutes of my time and things like that. Um, if you're a startup and nobody knows who you are, uh, you're on that, that treadmill. Um, when I would send an email and say, hey, um, I'm going to be in town, or I would just send an email out to the Snort mailing list. I'm going to be in, uh, in San Francisco next week, and I'm speaking at this conference, and I'm going to be hanging out there for three days. I get emails back, hey, you want to meet? Um, you know, hey, we're doing an IDS project. You want to you come over and we can talk about it and stuff like that? Or, you know, it's even the, it even works now, where, you know, my sales guys will say, hey, Marty, they won't meet with me, but they will meet with you. So, could you come? Um, it gives you respect, too. So one of the, you know, and, and this is, okay, so this is a weird phenomenon of, of the open source and something I'm not entirely comfortable with. And really, I'm not, I, I was, I've been debating about whether I should talk about it at all. So, and, and the reason is, it all goes back to that pretentious slide. I don't, I don't want to come off like a pretentious jerk. But um, that said, let's talk about me. Um, I think uh, one of the really interesting things uh, and one of the effects of open source, and maybe it's my particular reputation or the reputation of the technology, I'm not sure how this came to be, um, but there's a big difference between being a big vendor, being Cisco and walking in a room and trying to win a deal, uh, and, or some startup walking in a room and trying to win a deal away from Cisco, and walking in a room to try to get a deal away from Cisco or some other vendor, and you know, before the meeting opens up, you get five guys from the buyer, five people at the company who are thinking about buying your stuff, asking you for autographs. I get that. I don't know why. My wife thinks it's really weird, but it get, I get that. And do you have any idea how meaningful that is? Do you have any idea how huge that is? This dark matter thing down here at the bottom is, uh, um, you know, back to the, uh, the universal uh, uh, theme I was talking about a few minutes ago. Um, open source gives your company mass, more mass than it actually has. So one of the big problems they've got in the universe is that, um, you know, gravity doesn't quite work right on large scales and they've, they've come up with things like dark matter and dark energy to explain it. So the universe has this kind of hidden mass that holds everything together and they're not quite sure what it is or how it works. Open source is kind of that way too. Open source gave Sourcefire mass. Back when Sourcefire was nothing, back when, you know, a car crash going to lunch could have literally wiped out the whole company. Um, we had mass. People treated us as they treated a lot of these other companies. And yeah, they thought, you know, in the final analysis, when you started looking at the numbers and things like that, um, the financial guys would say, hey, wait a second, these guys, you know, these guys barely exist at all. Why are you thinking of spending this much money with them? Well, you know, as far as the, the people who were doing the buying, the technical decision makers were concerned, we were on an equal footing with all the biggest vendors out there, even when we were 30, 40, 100 people. Um, so, Open source gives you that, too, because open source establishes your name, it establishes your presence, it gives you uh, credibility in a room full of people that you wouldn't have otherwise. Okay. So open source theories. So we'll uh, come into the, to the home stretch here. Um, so these are my pet open source theories that I've, uh, I've kind of developed over the past few years of uh, uh, working at Sourcefire and uh, developing Snort and things like that. Uh, this top one is probably one of the most important ones, and this talks about the v business value of an open source project. Uh, I believe that the business value of an open source project is related directly not to the technology itself, but to the size of the project in terms of the community. How big is the community? How vibrant is the community? How frequently do releases come out? You know, how big is this thing? So Snort has at least several hundred thousand users. We have a hard time getting real metrics around Snort in a lot of ways. We have uh, a few hundred thousand people registered on snort.org um, and we know how many downloads we get and how many people download rules, updates on Microsoft Tuesday and things like that. It's at least in the hundreds of thousands, maybe in the, in the low millions of users of Snort. 
Uh, we acquired the ClamAV technology at the end of uh, 2007. Uh, the ClamAV technology gets a million unique IP addresses a day updating the signature database. A million a day. It's a much bigger project than Snort. So we acquired it. <laughs> Why did we do that? We haven't monetized it yet, but we acquired it. Why did we do that? Because it's got a large open source community. And what are these guys? Well, if I can figure out a way to monetize 1% or 5% of them, I can figure out how to solve the pain for 1, 5, 10% of them, that's going to be a significant amount of money coming into SourceFire. And I'm not going to go into the reasons why we haven't monetized it yet, but, you know, but we are continuing to work on it. So open source projects, and this is actually fairly rare. You know, if you look at like SourceForge, SourceForge is the graveyard of a thousand Perl scripts, right? It's, uh, there's all this stuff out there that's uh, um, just out there, neglected, uh, wasted. You know, I saw something not too long ago that the, the median uh, number of developers uh, listed in a SourceForge, SourceForge project is one, and uh, you know, um, the vast majority of them are abandoned. Uh, it's really interesting. Getting critical mass in an open source project is actually pretty tough. And like I said, I can't, I can't explain uh, why Snort took off the way it did, other than I was having fun putting out releases and interacting with people. It was fun for me. So, you know, the first two years of Snort development were all in my spare time and just me, me having fun and doing stuff that I thought was neat. But building this community up, you know, that has value. Because once you've got that community in place, you can think about monetizing some percentage of it. Because they're going to have a problem that you can solve. So open source users are your farm team. I talked about this inflationary idea. Growing the size of the community grows the size of your addressable base. Whether or not, you know, whether or not that as a percentage, it stays constant. Uh, that's a really big deal too. So what does this mean practically? It means you can't close your open source project. If you've got an open source technology and it's popular and it's well known and it's out there and it's doing things like opening doors and gaining credibility for you, building trust, um, things like that, um, it's absolutely critical that you keep it open. Because as soon as you close that technology, you've done two things. If you're not the leader in the space, you've done two things. And chances are you're not. If you're coming from an open source position, you're not. Number one is you've pissed off your community, right? So all these people who are your buddies are no longer your buddies because they're mad that you took away their toy. Uh, you know, you took your ball and you went home. Well, that's great. Well, they're all going to go see if they can find another ball, make another ball, something like that. And then the other problem that happens when you do this is that you just went from being an open source vendor with kind of the open source cachet and this open source community who was interested in some regard to your technology, you not only just did that, you not only just got rid of that community, but you also just turned yourself into a tiny proprietary vendor that does this one thing. And yeah, it's got a good name for itself, but you know, the people who used to like you who would open the door, they're not there anymore. So once you've committed to open sourcing a project, I think you really got to stick at it. And, you know, and this is an educational process both inside and outside your companies. Um, some places you'll show up, and I've gotten it before, they show, you show up at the door and you say, you know, hey, I'm the Snort guy and I want to sell you my Snort solution and stuff like that. And they'll say, oh, you can't trust open source because it's less secure than, than proprietary systems. You know, I read it in Microsoft Systems Journal <laughs> or something. Um, you get that. You get that pushback from the customers once in a while. And that's, that's happening a lot less now. The other pushback that you get is from non-technologists within your company. And this is an educational process. When we hired on our, our star management team at SourceFire, um, as they came on board or as I interviewed them, it was, you know, the line was always, this stuff's going to be open source. And if you, you know, if you can't deal with the whole open source concept, the whole open source model, you need to think about whether you want to really be here because we're not going to close source this technology. It's going to be open from now on and that's it. And every improvement that we make is going to go back out there uh, in this technology. So people, you know, you had to get your management signed up for it as well. Otherwise you're going to be facing this constant relentless pressure from the people who don't get a how open source work, who don't get what the value of uh, the open source technology is, pressuring you to close it down. And then the last point about uh, the open source technology is that it's absolutely critical if you're going to start a, a, a company, product company, around an open source technology that you own the technology. You've got to be me or the guys at Clam AV or whoever that start the company. It can't be some third party trying to monetize it because I guarantee you as soon as the person who's actually doing all the work sees that you're making a lot of money and not giving any to them, um, they're probably either going to become hostile and start changing things that break your system, uh, or they're going to go start their own company, and all of a sudden you're going to be competing from a, uh, a real disadvantage, right? Because at SourceFire, what can we control with Snort? I control everything. I control when it gets released. I control the features. I control the uh, rule language. I control the configuration file formats. I control the uh, output formats. I control all of this stuff. 
So if you're trying to interpret stored output and I'm changing the output formats every release, I'm giving you a lot of work to do. You're always going to be behind me uh, in that game. If I change the stored rules language, you're always going to be behind me and getting your stuff updated to be able to work with it. If I put new features in there, you're going to be behind the curve on integrating them into your technology because especially if they're big new features like our systems that we're doing uh, self-tuning with and things like that now, uh, you're not going to have the infrastructure to do that at all. You're going to be at a radical disadvantage from the person who owns that technology. So you've got to own the technology. If you really want to be successful with it, uh, and it's a, something that you can get your hands around like a snorter or a clam AV, uh, you really need to own that technology. Otherwise, you're going to have a significant hurdle placed in front of you from the get-go that's always going to be there. Because let me tell you, if you try to IPO a company and you don't own the core IP, you got a problem. <laughs> You're going to show up on Wall Street, you're going to go to Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs or whatever, and they're going to say, okay, well, I'll tell you what, how about no? Uh, you know, you guys are a services company or, you know, whatever. What would happen, Peter? I mean, this came up when we were doing uh, SourceFire's IPO. Um, who owns the code? How much of the code do you own? Have there been any uh, contributions? When are you going to clean, up, clean it up? All that stuff. That came up. Peter was an uh, analyst at Morgan Stanley when SourceFire uh, went public, so he had front row seats. <laughs> now he sits in the back, that's right. <laughs> That's okay. So that's, uh, that's pretty much it. So, you know, if you, if you pull all the stuff together uh, and do it right, you can be an achiever just like me. <laughs> so so that's, uh, that's how, to, how to make mad loot with open source. So are there any, uh, any questions out there? Okay, so the question uh, basically is, um, did uh, um, you know this whole open source thing influence you know what kind of term sheets you got, what quality of term sheets you got uh, from third parties? Um, you know the VCs didn't seem to have a real problem with it. You know Red Hat uh, was out there, um, so they understood basically open source uh, to some level, and open source even then had kind of a cachet with it. The big problem, especially in 2001 was, uh, um, you know, companies like VA Linux just completely blew up, and really Red Hat stocks uh, um, took a big hit during the dot-com bubble burst, as I recall. Um, so, you know, one of the things that they said in 2001 was, you know, hey, kid, look at all the open source companies that are smoking wreckage right now. Uh, you, you sure you want to you wanna do that? And open source is dead. You know, call me back when you make some money. Um, that was a problem initially, but, you know, the interesting thing is that if you get if you can get one of the VC partners on your side, kind of explain the logic of what you're doing and why it's going to work and how it's going to work and things like that, you can make the case. And really, you know, I'm a sales guy to some extent, but I'm a very logical kind of person, so I, I tend to state things in, in those terms. Um, if, if you can, and a lot of VCs are engineers. They're former engineers or, you know, they're guys with technical backgrounds. So if you can make that case to them, make the logical argument, they'll, they'll, they'll take it and they'll think about it for a while. And, and you know, so I, I don't think it, it influenced our term sheets tremendously. I think the things that were much more influential on our early term sheets were uh, the experience and the, uh, the revenue lumpiness and lack of revenue and stuff like that. That was much more influential to them because all those guys, um, they want to hear about your technology first and then as soon as they, you know, they decide whether or not it has any merit at all, then it's all financials, financials, financials. How are you going to sell this stuff? I can't tell you how many meetings I sat through in the, during the Series A process um, where we talked about sales. And, you know, I'm not a sales manager by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, I remember one meeting when they were talking about, you know, so you're going to be direct sales or you're going to be channel sales. And I said, well, you know, I think we're going to start off direct and then get into channels uh, as we mature. And they said, do you have any idea how hard it is to set up a channel? You know, setting up channels is, you know, it's like climbing Mount Everest or something like that. And I said, you know, I looked at the guys, I was like, well, well Microsoft did it, right? Yeah, um, you know, Symantec did it, all these big companies did it, so it's a problem that's solvable, isn't it? I mean, this isn't utterly impossible, it can be solved, it's just a matter of getting the pieces together, isn't it? They're all like, yeah, but it's really, really hard, and, you know, chances of you getting it right, they're, they're thinking about the Powerball lottery, right? Uh, chances of you getting it right are pretty slim, and they were right. <laughs> chances of me getting it right are very slim, but if I hired in the right guy who I didn't have at that time, uh, they get much better. <clears throat>
Sure. Um, okay, so there's a, a few things there. So, um, so the question is, uh, if I take third-party contributions uh, with automatic assignment of rights of those contributions, uh, does that make it less attractive to VCs? Actually, that'll probably make it more attractive to VCs because they want to have the, the IP bundled up in one entity as much as possible because when you have that, you can sell it, you can OEM it, um, you, can, uh, um, you can do whatever you want with it, right? You can, t you can sell it to somebody else, uh, you can license it out. If you have all this open source entanglement with a bunch of third parties that have contributed code that you don't own, that you don't have copyrights to, and this, there's all sorts of legal hairballs out there um, that are around this. If you can get it all yours, you should get it all yours. And in fact, with recent versions of Snort, we've got riders in the Snort uh, licenses that basically clarify what our interpretation of the GPL v2 is. And quite frankly, GPL v2 is open to interpretation. So if you look at uh, like Nmap or Snort, we basically say, hey, look, if you want to contribute to this project, cool. Anything that you contribute belongs to us. We consider those to be gifts and you know, um, they're assigned to Sourcefire. If you have a larger module of code that you want to contribute to the system, send us an email and we'll talk. Um, but we want as little third party ownership of our core open source code base as possible because that really um, limits us, constrains us from maximizing what we can do with that code base. So VCs will be much more favorable if you have everything tied up in a nice legal bow with your open source technology. Open source users might be a little less uh, inclined to contribute to it on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, you know what, at the end of the day, most of those guys want free stuff that works well and, you know, if they can get their feature into it, they're pretty happy about that. There's a lot of pragmatists out there. For, you know, for all the revolutionaries out there who are, you know, who have the proper revolutionary spirit, there's a hundred people who just want to get work done. And uh, most people can live with that. And, you know, I, I know I'm saying this right down the road from uh, MIT. I'm sure Stallman's going to storm in the room any, any minute now and uh, club me to death. Uh, but uh, I think there's a lot of room for compromise with open source projects. <laughs> All open source, okay, so the question is, is Snort a read-only open source project? All open source projects are read-only. You have the code, so if you want to make local changes and, and distribute them yourself, you're free to. Um, but if you want to get something into the code tree, it's not, it's not a democracy. You know, this is a, a common misconception with open source projects that we get from our competitors all the time. They say, oh, any jackass can contribute to Snort, and it can be doing who knows what. Uh, you know, back doors and you know, all sorts of stuff and crashes and buffer overflows and all this other crap. Um, open source projects, a well-run open source project is a benevolent dictatorship. There's one guy at the top of the pyramid who says what gets in and what does not. So they're all read-only because you have to get that guy to say, okay, I'll put that into the code base, uh, or it's not in the code base. Um, so the difference here is that I'm accepting your code, and I don't want to have the legal encumbrance of looking out for your copyrights and your uh, interpretation of the GPL and things like that. Because quite frankly, from a business standpoint, that gets real hairy in a big hurry. Do you have a question, Adam? Sure. Right. Okay. So the question is, what was the most monetizable feature or features that I built on top of Snort starting the company? Um, the things that I identified early on, uh, you know, it's pretty easy. You know, if it takes me seven hours to install one of my competitors' products, ease of installation. Put it on an appliance, make it so you can turn it on and get it up and running in about 15 minutes. So ease of installation and really data management and data analytics. This is a dirty secret of the intrusion detection industry is that everybody's all about detection. Nobody wants to talk about data. Well, all these things do is generate data all day, every day. How are you going to manage it? If you deploy a million dollars worth of vendor X's gear and then you call them back and say, hey, I want to manage all the data now. And they say, call Oracle. They make a really nice database. You're, you should be pissed off because they, they only did ha solved half the problem for you. So data management for us was a big thing. So put a GUI on it that allows me to work with lots of data, put a database right in the system that's going to scale with the amount of data that I can expect in most of my deployments, that sort of thing. So, so uh, is, is that just a thing you really bring up to the installation process? Like, where, where the vendors are shipping out, like, you install, install boxes, for example, and then you don't buy the product, that they start getting money, or is it? 
Um, well, the, the, the seven-hour case that I'm identifying was actually an appliance, believe it or not. Uh, and the, uh, the five-hour case was a piece of software that ran on top of Windows. Yeah, so uh, one, one you had to install, and there was all sorts of key management stuff. And the appliance had three GUIs. It had a fat, uh, Windows FAT client, it had a web GUI, and it had a Java GUI. I mean, it had three GUIs for the thing. And then the stack of documents that it came with was this thick, and, you know, half of it was talking about routers. So, I mean, um, there was no uh, intuitive way to get into the product at all. It was almost uh, built as if, you know, it had been built um, to, to maximize consulting hours, effectively. Any more questions out there? We're pretty much at my time limit, so I should probably wrap up. Uh, well, I'd just like to thank everybody for uh, uh, coming and spending some time with me today. If anybody has any questions or follow-up, I'm going to be here through tomorrow. So uh, feel free to catch up with me, and I'd uh, love to chat about this stuff. I'll th thanks very much.